This week on 1% Weekly, we see what lessons we can learn from Coca-Cola's takeover of Costa Coffee. We start a series of interviews with art investment guru Aidan Meller, and we look at why Paris has gone ahead of London when it comes to the ultra-rich. What were you doing in 1971? Well, that's when Bruno and Sergio Costa set up their eponymous coffee chain, initially as wholesalers, but then in 1978, they opened their first cafe. They worked hard over a 24 year period and built it up to a chain of something like 38 restaurants by the mid nineties. Then Whitbread came along and offered them 19 million pounds for it. Now, that was only a year after the National Lottery started, so those brothers must have felt that they'd won the jackpot when they came along with a price like that. And you know, so often what happens next is that the big company makes a real bodge up of running the business, and often the owners end up buying it back off them for next to nothing. Well, you can't lay that accusation at Whitbread's door. They've done a stellar job of building that business up to the point where it had something like 2,400 outlets in the UK and another 1,400 overseas. Now they've owned it for 23 years, which is just one year less than the founding brothers, and they have sold it themselves to Coca-Cola for 3.9 billion pounds. Now, Whitbread themselves only valued it at 2.3 billion, which was still you know, 120 times what they paid for it, so they've done an absolutely amazing job. So why does Coca-Cola come along and pay a 70% premium to the enterprise value? Well, although the numbers might be big, there's some really key lessons here for all of us business owners. Firstly, you often find that the founders of a company can only take it so far before they kind of run out of steam and run out of ideas. In this case, they'd gone from a wholesaler to opening a coffee shop at a time when that was still quite a new idea. Then they built it up to 38 coffee shops in some of our key locations. By that time, they were probably getting a bit tired. <clears throat> when somebody came along with a big offer, they took the money and they retired. Uh, Whitbread have then taken it on to these higher heights with a significant amount of investment in infrastructure, distribution network, and so on. But then along comes an even bigger company, and you can see the scale of this from the fact that uh, Costa have something like 450 outlets across the whole of China. Their biggest American rival, Starbucks, has got 600 in just one Chinese city. So you know that you know, they are on a, a totally different level. But Costa are the second biggest chain in the world. So why have Coca-Cola paid this premium? Because they don't want to take 47 years building up a major coffee playing chain. So they've gone straight in as the number two in the global coffee market which is something like an 80 billion a year market, and they have a, a market cap of about 190 billion. So paying you know, four, 4.3, whatever it is in dollars, is not that big of a deal for them. They can cover it and they get instant presence in a global market that is growing rather than their traditional fizzy drinks market, which is shrinking. If you were the CEO and they have a British CEO who obviously remembers Costa from his uh, days growing up in the West Midlands, uh, you'd want to diversify into other markets. So that's what he's doing. A couple of years ago, he bought the Innocent Smoothies brand. And that took a bit of doing because obviously their kind of tree-hugging clientele wasn't so keen on this sugary, fizzy drinks merchant taking over their, what they saw as health drink brand. But they managed to get through that and I'm sure they'll make a really good go of Costa because what they now have is something else to integrate into their existing global distribution network. And if you look at the success of a company like Coca-Cola, 90% of it is down to their distribution infrastructure and probably 10% down to the product itself. And now they've got something else to put through that existing structure they should be able to go even more global, faster than Whitbread could have done it. 
It's also a win for Whitbread because they've got some activist shareholders who feel that this was probably a non-core brand and that maybe the parts could be greater than the sum of the whole. If you like, the value of these individual pieces taken away from the core business is actually higher and realizes more value to shareholders. So they're probably wanting to see more investment in things like Premier Inns, which have been another success story for Whitbread. And so they will feel comfortable about this deal as well. So whatever size of business you're in, there are lessons to be learned from why Coca-Cola has just bought this coffee chain and why particularly they've paid a 70% premium for the privilege. Recently, I've been delighted to be working with art expert Aidan Meller and we've now gone as far as launching the Mella Art Club to give people the chance to learn how to invest in art. Aiden has developed a system that helps you buy art, add value to the art once you've bought it, and then sell it for the maximum value. And the whole process has been systematized end to end so that people can come in as newbies, go through a process of learning and being mentored through the system and then become collectors and even eventually perhaps connoisseurs if the bug really bites them. So let's get started with the first interview with Aidan on the subject of how you can safely invest in your first piece of art. So Aidan, uh, I think one of the things that surprised me the most when we started working together was that uh, you know, household name artists have works available at prices from you know, 10,000 pounds upwards. And it's not just the, the, the province of the billionaires we see in the auctions on the news. So you know, tell me about what kind of stuff's available at these more affordable prices. Yeah, people are often surprised by that. You get names like Picasso, Matisse, Chagall. These are huge names and they think million pound price tags, which of course they are. But of course, people forget that they've got the whole preparation for those paintings. So you've got drawings, you've got sketches, you've got doodles even, you know, and as long as they're authentic authenticated that they really are proven to be part of that artist's oeuvre, they're really exciting. And let me tell you why. They're particularly exciting because they actually show the thinking of the artist before the final painting. Mm. So to have sketches, I think, are particularly uh, have that wow factor because you can get into the, the ideas that they crossed out. You know, we had a Burne Jones once, a drawing, uh, and he, uh, the, we, I saw the painting in the V&A. We had some drawings for this painting, but in the drawings, one of the figures was a, a, a female in the painting, but it was a male in the original drawing. So he changed his mind to the gender of that picture. So that makes it really exciting. Yeah, and I think that also brings out something that I've, I've, I've learned from, from working with you, which is that, that there are so many stories around these artworks and, and that the, the fascination is not just the finished work, but understanding the artist and the story. Yeah, and do you know what? The, 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 there's so many areas you can go with that. Obviously, you can do the, the biography of the artist, what they were doing, who they were with, who their lovers were, all of that, which is obviously interesting on one level. But you've then got what they're painting of you know, it's not always autobiographical. They are illustrating a story which is interesting at that time. And why is that story interesting at that time? So you've got both the artwork story and you've got the artist story. But I think we, we shouldn't go too far without bringing kind of what might be the elephant in the room for anyone watching this, which is, you know, I suppose fear would be the best way of describing it. Fear that, you know, I, I get ripped off, I don't know what to yeah, buy. Yeah, terrifying, absolutely and, terrifying. You know, I know you've actually developed a, a system for our investment which effectively takes away the risk and the pain. So give me some sort of flavour of what that system involves. Yeah, basically, um, I, I could see the fear in people's eyes, especially when they're coming to it for the first time. So I thought to myself, how do I take them from complete novice all the way through to connoisseur? Is that actually possible? And do you know what it is? It is possible. So what I've devised is chunks of information that take people through on a, a collector journey so that actually each time they go, ah, oh, okay. And it just give, builds that confidence. It builds an infrastructure of, uh, of certainty that actually they can operate. And it's liberating because of course, when they first come to me, they're like, okay. And the, you, know, you do the first little bit, oh, so I can prove that it's a real one, not a fake. Oh, I can prove that it's this value and not another. And so when you start to do those reassurances, they then, you know, it liberates them to get involved with the art world. 
I think it, it, it's, it's fair to say that this kind of approach is, is, is pretty unique in the art world, in, the, in that you're effectively you've got a system that takes them through the whole process of, of investing in art, adding value to it, and potentially even selling it at the best uh, price. So um, if we start at the beginning with this, uh, 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 the system for investing in art, uh, I know you, you do a, a whole series of talks on this for yeah, members of the, of, of the Mellor Art Club. Um, Give me a flavour of what sort of things you'd bring up in the, this first talk about you know, investing in art for the first time. Well, the very first talk we do was basically getting them to be able to operate. Some people do want to go straight away and buy straight away, but how can they do that? So I've come up with an acronym called SAFETY, and the SAFETY is an acronym that goes through all the things that you ought to have a checklist before you purchase something. So even from the word go, if you are absolutely itching to get into buying a, a collection for yourself, you can just by using this safety acronym, you are able to do that. Okay, so um, I mean, we haven't got time in, in this short discussion to go through the whole thing, but maybe you could just pick a couple of letters from the acronym and just give us a flavor of what oh, they cover. They're, they're, they're all great, but okay. Um, Let's do A for authenticity, because that is something that people do worry about. You hear terrible stories on the news about, you know, a million pounds, and suddenly it's a fake and it's awful. So what you do is, uh, A, uh, as an example, is there is actually a body behind each artist's uh, world. It's either the family themselves or some kind of uh, foundation behind them. And they have a, a, a list of everything that they have, uh, that the artist has done in a catalogue resume. So that is one tiny little example within A where you go, oh, so if I go to that, I can check whether this is actually what, not just been done in you know, the back room by somebody else. Right. Because if they don't know about it, it therefore might be a fake. So, uh, I guess it's worth saying that what we're talking about here are, are established uh, artists. I've heard you use terms like museum quality. That yeah. these are we're not talking about some guy that you see on the high street who's just you know uh, rushed off no, a few still no. lives. These they are, wouldn't have catalogue resumes, yeah. but all the big artists usually do. Uh, and so you're able to refer to that collection of works which we know that artist has done, and it gives just that one little bit of information gives an enormous confidence. You go, Right, I can refer to that and I can see that actually this is part of that collection that the foundation has said is part of, you know, part of the oeuvre. Right, so, yeah. right. And I think I've heard you say that, that you know, 90% plus of art you just wouldn't even look at from an investment perspective. Yeah, if they're not involved, if the artists are not involved with museums, which is the only independent arbiter of taste, mm. I wouldn't touch them. Okay. So in that one statement, you've got rid of 90% of the art market. So, uh, so that's another thing. This is all from the first talk, so this is good. So from safety, you know, you, you go through, and I go into the role of the museums, very, very critical to the, to the success of that artist because they're going to keep promoting. So it is important that you know, uh, really do get behind understanding this checklist because doing that checklist, you can then go in very, very confident straight away. I think we've got time for one more little extract from the safety acronym. What, what else would you pick on as a, oh, okay. just to give us a flavour? Uh, yeah. um, trend, uh, safety, the trend is obviously you don't want to get by an artist, even if they're in museums, that are completely out of uh, fashion and, and not interested and they've just died away. And some artists do indeed just die through time. So you want, in actual fact, the opposite of that, where they're hot, uh, that's the word that they use in the art world. When an artist is hot, it means that they're, uh, they're trending uh, well, that people are getting involved with them, they're getting excited, but, and um, in actual fact, the, the, the auction prices and the records for that artist are, are going through the ceiling. And if you can get, obviously, you, you're on an existing wave, so you just by purchasing it and allowing that trend to take hold, you are going to make a good investment. And I guess the, these trends sort of uh, uh, work out over a number of years. We're not talking, this is not sort of cryptocurrency land where these trends go from day to day. This is a, no, that's a, right. a trend you can actually relax and, and, and invest in. There are spikes, absolutely. Um, but actually, um, yeah, it's a slightly longer term from that point of view. But it depends what your attitude is. If you want a, a quick return and you go for an artist that is, is, is absolutely moving quickly, if you want a, a good, solid, sensible one that you know is not going to go up or down and, and do the vagaries of the markets, then you're going for a much more solid artist to do that. So your attitudes to investing is going to be part of that too. 
Fantastic. That's all we have time for this week, but thank you very much, Aidan Miller. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, it's possible to buy museum quality art by famous artists from as little as £10,000. And if you follow Aidan's system, you can do so in safety. Next week, Aidan's going to tell us how you can actually add value to art once you've bought it. So don't miss that. Did you know that planet Earth has 256,000 ultra high net worth individuals? They're defined as having a net worth of $30 million or more. And yes, there are a quarter of a million of them on the planet. Now there's an organization called Wealthex that likes to kind of track them and where they live and where they're going. And one of the most fascinating things that's happened just in the last 12 months is that Paris has overtaken London to become one of the top five cities globally for these ultra high net worth individuals. And of course, it's all down to the change from President Hollande to President Macron. You might recall Monsieur Hollande introduced his 75% solidarity contribution tax, followed weirdly enough by a mass exodus of wealth from France. The Hollande-induced exodus was particularly noticeable in Paris, where lots of very expensive apartments were suddenly on the market. Well, President Macron has come in and he has changed the wealth tax so it now only impacts property assets. That's effectively reduced it by about 70%. He's also reduced and removed the top rate of income tax and he's made capital gains tax a single 30% charge. So he's lowered taxes and he's simplified taxes. Are you listening, Philip Hammond? And guess what's happened? Loads of super wealthy people have come back to Paris. Because as I keep saying, people will go to where they are well treated. Money goes to where it's well treated. And now he has reversed years of decline by just making some quick and simple changes to a few laws that make it attractive for people to come back. So what that means is loads and loads of capital and loads and loads of spending will return to the French economy. And Britain is the only country in the top 10 that's actually lost places and lost some momentum. Hong Kong has taken over from New York at the top of the hit parade with 10,000 ultra high net worth individuals. New York has a mere 8,900, Tokyo 6,800, Los Angeles 5,300, and then we get Paris with 4,000 and London with 3,800. So why has London gone down? Well, Brexit uncertainty and of course, the potential for our good friend Jeremy Corbyn to find his way into 10 Downing Street, which can't have been helped by the recent potential vote of no confidence in Theresa May and all the kind of uh, uh, groundswell of opinion against her Chequers deal on Brexit. So that uncertainty is now meaning that we are becoming the kind of uh, pariah here, if you like. We are the bête noire, we are the uncertain future and money goes away from that kind of uncertainty. So although these are a relatively small number of people, I think they do give us a quite interesting insight into the trends, you know, where the runes are going in terms of the economic uh, strengths of the nation. So um, Hong Kong very much on top, Tokyo right up there as well, and of course the Japanese economy is starting to pick up now after years in the doldrums. Uh, who knows about America? There are those that say Brexit will have nothing in terms of the impact on this country versus what Donald Trump is doing to America. Only time will tell. But at the moment, I think the thing that I want to, to point out is how quickly and easily a new president has come in place in France, made some changes and reversed a trend that went on for years. So suddenly, within months of becoming president, he has attracted a lot of wealthy people back to the country. Now, there's a bit of a backlash about that. You can imagine what the French are like with anything to do with this. They, they are, you know, it's all about egalité and all that sort of stuff. Well, up to a point. But the reality is uh, countries need these wealthy people. Economies need the money they spend, the jobs they create, um, and the capital that they bring back into the economy. So 
I think he's done a very smart thing. Uh, I'd like to think that we'd have a similar budget coming up in the autumn here, but I somehow doubt it. So I think be very careful about what's going to happen here because the smart money is leaving London for foreign shores. Thanks for watching 1% Weekly. If you like what you see, why not subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell so you get notified every time we broadcast a new program. Or if you just want to watch another video, how about this one? Are you, are you going to make a choice then? Because you know, I can't sort of stay here all day. You know, I'm getting a bit, my hands are getting tired. So, you know, in your own time. <laughs>